Good afternoon. Let's get started. Our speaker next week will be Professor Shazin Atari, who is an assistant professor at Indiana University, and she will talk to us about perceptions of energy and water use. She has been doing a lot of data collection and analysis over the years around the U.S. on how people think about and perceive uh, using energy and water, and it's some really very interesting uh, research. And some of that actually ties a little bit to what we are going to listen today from Dr. Ariane Beck, who is our speaker today. Ariane is a research fellow in the Energy Systems Transformation Research Group, which, which I run at the LBJ School here. Uh, Ariane joined us about a little over a year ago, and since, since then she has been very active and very quickly become an expert in studying use of novel technologies, especially those focused on gamification and understanding uh, energy use behavior and adoption of new technologies. But more generally, she is interested in studying the, how interactions between the underlying social, economic, te technical, uh, and institutional factors impact diffusion of energy technologies, and in particular, how information provision or flow of information impacts uh, people's uh, perception and behavior about, uh, about energy usage and, and, and adoption. Before uh, joining the group, Arian was the project manager for consumer side smart grid technologies at the Pecan Street uh, Inc., which many of you know about or, heard of or have heard about. And uh, Arian actually has a, a background in engineering. She got her bachelor's, master's, and a PhD degree in electrical engineering from this very institution. So please join me in welcoming Arian. So let's see, okay, the microphone's definitely working. <laughs> Good afternoon, hope y'all are enjoying the rain. So, is this the full screen mode? I feel like there's a way to make that bigger. Yeah. There we go. All right, so we're gonna talk about energy games. And this is a gamification approach for decision making and behavior change in solar adoption. Uh, there are a few elements to this project and we're gonna go back and forth a little bit between background and how that fits into the experiment itself. So I wanted to give y'all the, the overview here. So we'll talk about the motivation for this research. Then we'll talk about um, the background on games, kind of how they work and, and how people um, interact with them. Uh, then we'll get into the experimental design itself, uh, followed by developing the content for our energy games. Um, the theory of planned behavior is one of many uh, theories on how people make decisions and what Im impacts their behavior. It's proven to be very effective in looking at the diffusion of innovation. Um, so that's the theory that we're going to be using to assess uh, the effectiveness of energy games, and that will lead us right into looking at the results and the impact of energy games. In, in the studies that we're doing. Um, and, and maybe just to start off and give you a little bit of, you know, kind of my motivation for looking into this research, um, I really wanted to start working on technologies that would help with, you know, things like climate change and just a cleaner environment, cleaner water, cleaner air. Um, and as I started looking at technologies, I really began to realize that we had most of the technology that we need to solve the issues of climate change. One of the big missing parts of that would probably be um, energy, you know, grid scale energy storage. Um, but I thought if we have so many of these technologies that we need, and of course they can always be made better, so there's still lots of research to be done, but why aren't we really using them? And that's how I really got interested into looking into the human, um, you know, the human factors of it. What's the human behavior? What's the decision making process um, when people decide which technologies to adopt? and which technologies you know, not to adopt. And um, definitely, I'm guessing a lot of you are, have an engineering background, and I would encourage you to uh, look into those human factors of engineering, because how people interact with technology um, is very important to the success of those technologies. Um, so in this case, we found that, that with solar adoption, there are a lot of information gaps. Um, and that also applies to energy efficiency, which I will talk about as well. In our game, we use both um, energy efficiency and solar information. And part of the reason for that was just in the experimental design. Uh, we didn't want too much self-selection bias. So if it's, hey, come play the solar energy game, we might only get solar enthusiasts. 
So by really um, kind of recruiting people to look at an energy efficiency game, um, energy efficiency really applies to everybody who you know, lives in a house and uses energy. Um, the other reason is that, that often people will promote energy, for energy efficiency first and then solar. And that's because with you know, policies, usually you don't get paid for excess generation. You know, on an annual basis, you can, you can go to zero, uh, but you don't usually get a refund. So you don't want to oversize a solar installation. Um, so just kind of in, in promoting efficiency first and then solar. Um, you can also do solar planning for efficiency, but, but you do want to size the system. Um, so having said that, I'll be going back and forth talking about examples both from solar uh, adoption as well as energy efficiency. Um, but yeah, these information gaps, they come from two sources. One is a lack of information, but then there's also information overload, right? We all get so much information coming at us every day. Um, even if we have all the information we would need to make decisions, we may not have time to read it all or filter through it all or figure out what are the reliable sources. Um, so, so this is definitely something that we need to address when helping people to make informed decisions about these technologies. Um, so we're asking, can gamification be that effective information dissemination medium? Um, can it bridge those gaps? And how does it affect people's subject knowledge? How about their attitudes? Can it actually have impact on their behavior? Um, and so, so that's really what we're going to be looking at. Um, going into why solar. Um, solar is a great match for Texas in so many ways. Um, right? the, the sunnier it is, the more energy it produces also the more energy that we use in our air conditioning. So that's a really good match. Um, it also doesn't require water uh, to operate. And in a drought prone state like ours, uh, <laughs> it's really good to have sources of energy that continue producing even in a lack of water. So um, we feel that solar is really important to the electricity future of Texas and the electricity um, transformation, this current energy transformation that we're in. Um, in the last five years, solar has dropped 78% in cost. That's a huge change and very rapid. And if you look at that cost curve, you know, it's kind of starting to level off. We're, we're in this part where we're starting to level off. Um, we're also starting to see some incentives uh, decline as well. So, so we think this is a really good time to, to uh, jump into solar. Um, it's also the lowest cost peak generation source in Texas. No price volatility because there's no continued fuel. Um, and cumulative through 2014, 330 megawatts have been installed. That's the size of kind of a medium-sized power plant, just to, to, to give you a relative idea. So it's a lot of energy, but it's still about, one, I think, less than 1% of Texas's generation capacity. And on the U.S. level, we're, we're right around half a percent. Um, so even with that low number, we're at 32% of all new generating capacity with solar. Um, which is great, huge numbers, huge gains, but it's still such a small mix of generation, and that tells you that we're really in, still in the early phase of solar. We still have a lot of diffusion left to do before this becomes a mainstream technology. Um, another thing that I think to point out that's really important is the numbers on the economy. There's um, you know, lots of jobs being generated from solar, and you can see that with any, any energy transformation. Um, you're going to have a lot of economic activity because you're buying a lot of new technology and, and you're changing a lot of things. Um, uh, so that takes me to, to looking at this pro-environmental behavior. So why are people choosing solar when they are? And a lot of times, you know, there is this, well, it can save money, but there's also this, I want to do something for the environment. And there's a lot of research on pro-environmental behavior showing that people often want to make pro-environmental decisions, but in the end, they often aren't. And so we're trying to figure out, you know, why is that? What is that decision-making process? Where is the glitch um, happening? And part of that is cost. You're often looking at new technologies. New technologies, they're not to scale yet. There's still development costs that have to be offset. There's still lots of, you know, advertising um, to promote them. So they're definitely, you know, costing more initially. But are people really updating their perception of that cost? And when we see a nearly 80% drop in the cost of solar over five years, we can imagine that people may not be checking back in and finding out um, how that cost is going. Then trust is another big issue. Um, you might have heard the term greenwashing. And this is this idea behind, you know, there are all these environmental claims, but does it really help the environment? Um, you know, people, some people say with solar, uh, you know, this idea that it costs more energy to produce them. You know, this isn't true. They've now done the studies, and in less than two and a half years, um, depending on where it's produced, it's 18 months to about two and a half years. Um, all that energy has been... Uh, been reclaimed through, through the production. 
Um, but people have these questions and they have these issues of, of trust in the performance. You know, are the claims you're making true? And then will it perform the way you're promising it, it will? And since people don't have a lot of experience with solar because it is such a new technology, um, there's definitely some questions about how will it perform? Um, then we get into some of the more communication aspects of how people are responding. And um, the ostrich effect is a big one. That's when you're expecting bad news, you just stick your head in the sand. And some of the initial research on this was with stock portfolios and, and the market's headed down and people don't want to look. Um, so if people think solar costs way too much and it's really expensive, how do you get them to start listening to new information? How do you get them to start updating those um, perceptions that they have? And you know, once you do, you might run into confirmation bias. And this is the idea that, okay, now I'm listening, but I'm gonna hear what I wanna hear. So as you find new sources of information, as, as you read them, you pull out the parts that confirm your existing beliefs, and you kind of just glance over or forget the parts that were introducing new ideas or, or you know, changing, um, would change your current perceptions. Um, so, so that's also a, you know, an issue that you have to find a way to communicate information that has that ability to update people's perceptions. Um, the next one we get into is the, the finite pool of worry. And this is that you can only worry about so much at one time. And there's a great graph of this with the economy versus the environment. And as people's concern about the economy goes up, the concern about the environment goes down and, and vice versa. And so you see it kind of diverging and, and, and converging. Um, you know, I really like to get away from this idea, you know, solar definitely uh, can stimulate the economy. Environmental action is usually stimulating the economy. Um, but still, this is about people's perceptions, and, and this is difficult for people. How do, you, how do you get their attention? How do you get them to do all these things that you're asking them to do in terms of pro-environmental behavior or even just energy savings? Um, you know, you can only process so much at one time. And if you do get their attention, you might run into what's called the single action bias. And this is an idea that once you've done one activity, and this comes in a lot with energy efficiency, you give somebody a list of 50 things to do, they do one thing off that list, and they say, okay, I'm done, I've done my part. Um, so when you're addressing pro-environmental behavior, if you give, you know, install solar, buy an electric vehicle, install, you know, a more efficient air conditioner, people might take one action and then just stop. You know, I've, I've done my part, I'm doing a good job. And I put a recycle bin there because it's a little bit of a pet peeve of mine that so many people are like, I can do whatever as long as I use the blue bin, I'm good. <laughs> um, and that's really, if you remember, it, the three arrows were for reduce, reuse, and recycle. And it was an order of operations, right? Reduce first, then reuse, then recycle. But recycling was the easiest, so we all recycle. And that's, you know, that's a kind of almost a cultural single action bias um, that we've developed. So why do we want to use games to solve these problems of communication and how you get through to people? And one of those is that we can reduce information search costs. You know, it, it's, there's tons of information out there. How do you find the right information and the information that's applicable to you? And we can spend hours going through all that information and distill it down to a very compact, you know, list of kind of essential information that you need to know. Um, there's also the ability to challenge multidimensional information gaps. Um, by this, we mean there are a lot of different topics. You don't have to read one article on solar warranties and one article on, you know, um, solar pricing and net metering or, you know, each, in our particular game, it's a trivia style game and each question will kind of give you one topic and, and kind of condense that down for you. Um, so, you know, obviously there are other ways that you can approach information search costs and multidimensional information. Um, so what does games have that we think is really particular, particularly suited to solve that problem? And for us, it was really that ability to confront misperceptions. Um, you can read, you know, so many lists and so many articles, but that confirmation bias is just so easy. You know, like, oh yeah, yeah, I know how much solar costs. And so you just, you know, glance over the rest of the article or you move on. With this game, because it's a trivia game, you have to answer a question. And when you select an answer, even if you're 100% convinced you're right, if you're wrong, it's gonna come back and give you that feedback. And so that's really that interactive way um, that you can change people's uh, you know, opinions and change perceptions. And there has been a lot of research showing that active engagement is more effective than passive engagement for communicating information. Um, and that these kind of disruptive things, you know, like answering the questions, uh, can help with confirmation bias compared to just you know, reading um, more information. Um, so that's why we wanted to look specifically at, at games. And so we look at what makes games work? Why do people play games? How do they engage with games? 
And one of the commonly th used theories to explain this is self-determination theory. And this theory was not developed for games. Um, I'm not a psychologist, but I believe it was developed more looking at education studies. And, and they looked at autonomy, competence, and relatedness. And you can think of autonomy as, as having some control over what you're engaging with. Um, creative problem solving, for instance, versus just following a rote set of steps and procedures. So it really allows you to take ownership of something and engage with it in the way that you want to. Um, then we have competence. Um, you have to build competence. Uh, particularly with games, you'll see that, that you frequently have levels. And the first level is really easy, and you work your way up, and eventually there's, you know, there's a, what's called a boss fight. And, and when you finish that fight, then you level up. And this is a great way that you can gradually build mastery. Um, if you just start off with a really hard thing, you might find that people get really frustrated and then they just quit. Um, so games give us this ability to, to build mastery slowly so that people can really um, be comfortable with the information and not get frustrated and run away. Uh, and then we have relatedness, and that gets into social factors, wanting to engage socially and be a part of a community. And computer games and online games are particularly useful for this type of interaction. Um, it really provides a lot of social outlets now with our games. Um, we can also look at intrinsic versus extrinsic motivation. And intrinsic is that kind of self-motivation. You're doing it because you enjoy it. Extrinsic motivation is the rewards that come from outside. And when designing a game, you have to be very careful with extrinsic motivation because you can very quickly undermine the intrinsic motivation. Uh, there have been a lot of studies with this. One of them looked at donating blood. And if you just ask people to donate, they were really happy to do so. I think about half the people did. And then if you asked them, said, oh, we'll give you $7 if you donate blood, I, I believe it was $7, it dropped, um, I think, less than half the people that were donating before. Because people were now, instead of feeling good and doing something because it made them feel good, they're doing it for $7, and they're going, oh, I, don't, I don't really think this is worth $7. They then said, okay, well, what if we donate that $7 to an organization? And the numbers were turned um, almost to full scale of just donating blood because you return that intrinsic motivation of I'm doing a good thing. I'm doing this because I want to do a good thing. Um, they've done this with coloring examples where they reward children for coloring, and eventually they won't color unless they're getting a reward. Um, so we can see how this could very quickly undermine things, particularly something like energy efficiency. If we give you a reward for every activity that you engage in, when we're finished with the game, do you still engage in these activities when you're no longer getting your reward? And if you started off wanting to engage in energy efficiency because it was something that you could do for the environment, did we just undermine that motivation? So you have to be careful because you can have these unintended consequences depending on how you design the game. Another one that we look at is goal setting. And this is particularly useful when you have points. Um, you know, anything that you can count. So, so one study looked at um, rating movies. And if you just ask people to rate movies, you know, they rate so many. And then if you give them a goal, they actually rate a lot more. They might not meet the goal exactly, but they'll rate more than they would without the goal. But then they found if you keep raising the goal, eventually people rate even less. Because now they're going, oh, that's impossible. Right? And this gets back to the idea of competence and self-determination theory. Right? If, if we ask you to do too much and you say, I'm not going to get there, you just quit in frustration. So you have to be careful in setting goals that are challenging and meaningful to people, but that aren't so challenging that they become frustrating and demotivating. Um, and then competition is also another way. You know, we all know competition motivates a lot of people and really can get people engaged in activity. Um, so what are some of the elements of games? And one of the big ones is Bartle's players types. My husband actually develops um, entertainment computer games for a living, and they use this you know, in, in practice. So this, um, at first I thought, is this just an academic you know, study, and it's like, no, this is actually a very practical use for designing games. And, and they found that there were four primary player types. The killers who just want to dominate the game. Then you have the achievers who want to get all the points and get all the badges and, and do all the activities. Then you have the explorers who just want to see how the game works and look at everything in the game just, just to see what's going on. And then you have socializers who are there primarily for engaging in the game. And I believe this research was originally done in some of these um, you know, multiplayer online games. So very large social aspects. And they also found that people change how they interact with the game over time. So they start as killers, and then they become explorers, then they become achievers, and finally socializers. I think there are probably some interesting parallels of that with history, but um, 
that, that might be a different, different talk altogether. Um, so he went on to extend this research and actually develop this very complex 3D model that really gets into it. Um, we're not going to get into that, but, but basically what we see here is that the more of these, these motivation types that we can appeal to in the game, the more people that we can reach out to and engage with the game. Um, and then another aspect is points, badges, and leaderboards. These are used in most gamification techniques um, you know, to motivate people, give badges if you've accomplished a certain number of things, and then that competition through leaderboards. Um, this is just looking at some of the genres of games, first-person shooter, role-play games, massive multiplayer online games, just to go through the acronyms. You know, you've probably seen a lot of these games. Our game is a quiz type. It's, it's a trivia game. Um, you'll also see like flashcard games that are commonly used as quiz games. Um, the picture here, Climbway, this is a simulation game where you actually get to design your own city and your own climate plan. And then the simulation will tell you how your um, city affects the climate over 50 years. Um, so it's a really neat way to engage with people, and uh, the World Wildlife Fund did a similar game called Modern Mayor, and you actually get points in the game um, that you can use to vote on their campaigns in the real world. So it's a neat way to bridge the education of our energy systems and you know, how our modern world affects the environment, and then, and then bridge that into um, taking action. In, in the real world. And then I also put board games here on the bottom. It's just a reminder that not all games are on the computer these days. Uh, a lot of people are still very engaged with, uh, with board games. So types of games. Um, entertainment is probably the most common and the one that you've interacted with the most. And then we have gamification. And gamification is a funny thing because nobody exactly knows what it is. The most common definition I've come across is from, um, I'm not sure how to pronounce his name, Deterting. And he says, gamification refers to the use of design element characteristics for games in a non-game context. And the argument against that is that if you look at points, badges, and leaderboards, it kind of looks like school, right? You take an exam, you get points, you get enough points, you get a badge saying you completed that class. You collect enough badges, you get a diploma. It's another certificate. And if you got the most points, if you're the leaderboard winner, you're the valedictorian and you get a gold seal on your diploma. But it doesn't really feel like we're playing a game here. So <laughs> we're having fun, but it's not necessarily a game. So these guys, Hutari and Hamari, actually uh, wrote a paper dissecting these definitions and, and many definitions that people give for gamification and came up with this definition. A process of enhancing a service with affordances for gameful experiences in order to support users' overall value creation, which is a real mouthful. And I'm not 100% sure what it means. Um, but I think they're getting at if you can make something fun that you add value to something beyond just playing a game or having fun. Um, it's, it's actually a way to increase the value um, that something gives you. And, and that's kind of our idea, right, is, is that we can give people this value of energy efficiency and solar, but if we can make it fun, it's, you know, instead of being this, this work that they have to do after work, in, in order to, to make these decisions. Um, it's something that can be play. It's something that can be fun. It, it adds additional value. Um, there's also an idea of serious games and game-based learning. These are often used interchangeably, um, but when they're differentiated, serious games are usually aimed at training or behavior change, whereas game-based learning is strictly in the classroom. And it's interesting with game-based learning because most of the research in games um, seems to be in game-based learning. It's in the classroom. It's a captive audience with students. Um, so one thing that's really unique about our research is that we're looking at a totally non-captive, voluntary adult population um, that we're asking to play this game and, and engage with us. And um, we're also doing it in a randomized control trial, which there aren't very many studies that are, that are actually doing that either. Um, so that's been a, a unique challenge. And this is the overview of how we're wrapping games into this experiment. So we're starting with the pre-survey, this initial survey. And PPB is the theory of planned behavior. So we're, we're assessing um, perceptions about solar and about energy efficiency. Um, we're then dividing into two groups. We have the control group, which gets the silent treatment for two weeks. And then we have the game cohort that's going to play the game for two weeks. Um, and each week is a separate game. And you know, there are a number of reasons for this, but it's, you know, it's less commitment from people. You only have to play for a week. There's a leaderboard at the end of each week. If the points get too out of whack, you get to start over, and that can actually be demotivating when you're making points. If the top person on the leaderboard has so many more points than every, everybody else, then everybody else can start to be like, well, why am I still playing? 
I'm clearly not going to win. Um, so it actually is very effective to kind of wipe the slate clean at the end of week one and as we go into week two. Um, and then we have a final survey. And it's almost identical to the initial survey. And it's measuring those same TPB constructs that we're going to talk about a little bit later. And this allows us to make a comparison between the changes that the game cohort experienced versus the changes that the control cohort experienced. Um, so here's a game platform that we used. It's a trivia style game. It's actually a real time game. So in this case, everybody who's playing gets pinged at the exact same time uh, to play a question. And you can play the question or you can choose not to. Uh, if you choose not to, you can play it later in a makeup round because, you know, if you're driving or you're in a meeting, obviously you're not going to be able to. And then a, a clue display is, it, it serves two purposes. One, it kind of allows us to give people a hint. That way you can ask hard questions that you don't think they know the answer to, but they won't get totally frustrated by not being able to answer because they've got this, this extra little help. It also gives time for everybody to get their phone out, so kind of something to look at while everybody's getting um, lined up to answer together. So once everybody's there and ready, the question pops up. Um, you select an answer, and then as soon as you select an answer, you go to the insight. And you read that insight where you wait for everybody to answer the question, and they kind of compile the results in the leaderboard. And the insight is really great because it lets us explain the answer if it might be a little confusing or expand on the information. Um, then you go back to the question screen, and it tells you what the right answer is. And this is not immediate feedback that we're talking about. You immediately see it's green box and a check mark if you got it right. And if you got it wrong, the correct answer is still in green. And I believe the wrong answer is outlined in red with a big red X. And so if you thought, I've got this nailed, I really know this one, and you got wrong information or information that is no longer accurate, you're going to get immediate feedback to start updating that, um, that information. And then it'll go back to the insight box. And you'll see here at the bottom there's this learn more link. And that's where you get to give people additional information and additional reliable uh, resources if they want more information on that topic. And that's really important because there's a lot of information out there and it's not all applicable to everybody. So this, um, this was designed for Texas and people in Texas and really pri prioritize the things that are most important for, um, for those of us playing here. The other great thing about this game, um, it's a sliding scale for points. And we're only asking 15 questions a week, so it would be very easy for everybody to tie. And this gives us a great opportunity to, um, uh, to uh, with the sliding scale, you can actually differentiate the scores. And it, and it works really well. Nobody gets um, the same points. Um, and then it takes less than a minute for an entire question. So it's very quick. It's not intrusive in time. We can deliver a lot of information very rapidly. Um, so how do we develop the content? Well, the solar content, we're a solar research group. We know that stuff. Um, and we've done a lot of surveys and a lot of research, so, so we knew that stuff. The energy efficiency stuff was newer to us, and I found this great paper called The Shortlist. And, and Gardner and Stern worked this paper, and they and made the argument that you get all these exhaustive lists. This is this information overload. 50 things you can do to save the environment. And they cite one list of over 70 things that you can do. I don't know that anybody ever gets to the end of a list of 70, <laughs> let alone that they remember them. And one of the items on this list is to build a bad house which seems really like a random way to save the environment. Um, and you look at single action bias and you wonder, on this long list, which one thing are they walking away with? And it's not clear that it's really the thing that's going to be most effective towards saving energy um, or looking at um, climate change. So this was their list of topics that they thought were the most important, and this is what we used to, to develop that list of content. Um, one thing I took out, they, they did recommend on their curtailment, asking people to watch two and a half hours less of TV per day. And I thought, I think this game will be over really fast if I start telling people when to watch TV. Um, so we decided to keep it to um, topics like thermostat settings and water heater settings, things that are easy for people to do, um, looking for things like Energy Star appliances or LED light bulbs when you're replacing um, you know, things that you already have. And then solar PV systems, we're really getting into technology basics. Solar PV systems are different from all these other technologies in that they're not replacing anything. So when you think about how people are making decisions, when you're looking at upgrading a refrigerator or an air conditioner, you're often going to be looking at comparing to your existing experience. You can have a pro and con list. How's the new one better? And solar has this unique situation where we don't currently have energy generation systems on our homes. So how do we go about making a comparison? How do we evaluate this information? What information do we even need 
if we have no experience with it. Um, so really just getting the technology literacy, looking at cost, introducing leasing options, because that's relatively new in solar and a lot of people still aren't aware that that's even an option. And then incentives and rebates were, were a big topic for us. Um, so let's look a little bit at the theory of planned behavior. Um, so this is looking at these constructs of attitudes, subjective norms, and perceived behavioral control. And those three things lead to intention. And then perceived behavioral control on its own um, influences intention and behavior. Um, so that's a very important construct because it's both indirectly and directly influencing behavior. And there's a meta-analysis of about 200 studies using the theory of planned behavior. And they found that it accounted for 39% of the variance in people's intentions and about 7% of the variance in people's behaviors. So it really um, does a very effective job at accounting for a, a major portion of how people are making their decisions and determining their behaviors um, when it comes to, uh, to these topics. So looking a little bit more at what those constructs are. We have our attitude, and that's formed from your beliefs about a technology. What are the benefits? What are the positives? What are the costs and the negatives? Um, then we have subjective norms, your perceptions about how people will perceive that behavior. If you put solar on your roof, will people approve? Will they disapprove? Will they be annoyed with you? Will they think it's awesome? You know, how are they going to react? And that's one that we often underestimate how important it is to us, but there's a lot of research showing that it actually has a significant influence um, on how people use energy or, how, or, or what motivates people to do just about anything. And energy, you might have heard of O-Power, and they, on the bill, they'll compare you to your neighbors and kind of show you uh, this is what other people in your neighborhood are using, and that's been very effective to get people who are using a lot of energy to reduce their energy costs. Um, then we also see perceived behavioral control, and this measures a person's perception of their ability to perform the behavior. Um, so this might be that you think solar is awesome, but if you can't afford it, you can't get all those positives and negatives that you think come from the technology. Um, and like I said, that's the most important one because that's going to impact both your intentions um, and, uh, and the behavior. Um, so then I also put on here descriptive norms and personal norms. And these aren't part of the theory of planned behavior, but they moderate um, attitudes and they moderate norms and perceived behavioral control. Um, and descriptive norms are that perception of how people typically behave. What do people typically do? And this comes into play a lot with solar as we see that peer effects are very influential on, on people's uh, decisions. We often see solar starting to cluster in neighborhoods. As one person gets solar, other people start to gain more confidence um, in considering solar installations. So how did we integrate these, these constructs into the game? And you know, we did this in questions by asking um, about different properties you know, of solar or energy efficiency uh, that we thought would you know, shed positive light um, on them, or that would be empowering to people so they would know how to implement. You know, things like leasing solar um, can be very helpful to understanding that, yes, you can get a, a solar system even if you don't have ten or $15,000 laying around. Um, norms are particularly difficult. Um, you know, it's called subjective norms, and because we're using a trivia game, I can't very well say, what will your family think if you install solar? And then give you four options. I don't know your family. Um, and this could be different from every person playing the game. Uh, what we can do, though, is generally express norms. We can tell you that 40% of people's electric bill comes from heating and cooling. If you know that in the summertime your bill triples, you might start to go, oh boy, something's wrong here. Uh, we also have an insight that says that a solar system is installed in the U.S. every two and a half minutes. Uh, so that tells you that this is not some niche technology. This is really popular, and there's a lot of installation, and there's a lot of activity happening. Um, I'm not going to read to you the whole survey, but I just want to kind of put it up there for completeness. These are the questions we asked. Um, for energy conservation, um, like I said, we're really using this as a bridge into the game. And then we're also using this as another metric, another dimension on which we can evaluate the effectiveness of games. So we're not getting to a really precise definition of energy conservation here. Um, there's so many activities, you know, HVAC or setting your, programming your thermostat or weatherizing your home, that trying to measure people's behavior on all those dimensions um, would be a bit exhaustive, especially since our primary focus is on solar. Um, for the solar measures, we looked at affordability for perceived behavioral control. Though for attitude, we looked more at a, a suite of options like saving money, um, increasing home value, aesthetics, and then the environmental aspects. And when you ask people, those are the topics that come up most about the positives and negatives of solar. 
Um, for perceived, perceived behavioral control, though, really cost. If you can't afford it or you don't think you can afford it, you don't necessarily continue researching and looking into the other aspects of a solar installation. For intentions, we looked at considering solar, and then we looked at calling um, a solar installer for a quote. And part of the reason for that is because of the two-week time span of this experiment, it would be very difficult to get a solar installer out there to get a bid. It would be impossible to get a system installed in that two-week period. So it's a very difficult thing. Uh, I think typical decision periods are around eight or nine months. So something that's very difficult to measure in the context of this experiment. But we can look at intentions and perceived behavioral control that are direct antecedents of behavior and say, if we can increase those significantly, then there's a good chance that we can impact people's behavior. Um, so where did we send the survey? Uh, we wanted to send it to early markets, and, um, and we were working with um, AEP Texas. Um, so we looked at Corpus Christi, Abilene, and San Angelo. And those are you know, very sunny areas. Um, in addition to the 30% federal investment tax credit, AEP offered, at the time, they offered $1.20 a watt as part of their incentive. Um, so between those two, you're covering almost 50% of the cost of a solar installation in these areas. So this is a great place to get solar. Uh, very sunny and huge, huge incentives. Um, so we kind of have the question, boy, why aren't they? Um, so we looked at the initial results of the survey, and we see that people have very positive attitudes on energy conservation. Um, you know, we're in the mid-fives. We did this on a, a one through seven um, Likert scale, uh, you know, kind of the, the strongly agree to strongly disagree scale, and uh, seven was agree. So being there in the mid-fives, really positive attitudes, high, um, you know, very positive subjective norms, descriptive norms. Uh, personal norms were really high for energy conservation, um, over six. So that was, that was interesting. And then people are saying that they are conserving energy and that they are interested in this topic. And then we saw similar attitudes for solar, um, you know, very similar scores. Uh, but when we got to descriptive norms, you know, it dropped tremendously. And this is, you know, also interesting because energy conservation isn't particularly visible. Driving by someone's house, you can see if they have solar. But you can't see if they have a 16-seer HVAC or if they have R38 insulation in their attic or, you know, all these different aspects. Do they have their thermostat programmed? You have no idea. And yet somehow the descriptive norms for energy conservation are still much higher than the descriptive norms that we see for solar. Um, and that's also, you know, because this is an early stage market, people aren't seeing a lot of solar. Um, uh, that was an interesting differentiation. And then the other was perceived behavioral control. At just over three, it's really low. You know, being on a one to seven scale, four would be neutral. So when people are at a three, you have to question, they've just already said, I can't afford this. And so you do have to question, um, are they even paying attention to the information that's out there when they have you know, this, this low of a perceived behavioral control when it comes to acquiring solar. Um, and then finally, we, we asked people about their awareness of incentives. And 15% of the respondents um, were aware of incentives. So remember, this is an area where over 50% of the cost of solar can be covered by incentives, and only 15% of people are even aware that they're out there at all. Um, and this didn't even drill down to whether or not they knew about the local incentives or the federal incentives and, and that sort of thing. Um, so we're really seeing, this is where we can see this really big information gap, right? There, there's very low awareness of these programs. Um, so we then took this data, and I'm not going to go into a lot of the, the details on the methods. Um, I have a couple uh, slides on that if you want to see the results in more details. Uh, but we used regression models to look at uh, what were the most significant constructs in that theory of planned behavior towards determining intentions and behaviors. And PBC was the only factor that was significant across all of the models. So all the factors were significant in one model or the other, but this is the only one that across all the models um, showed up as being significant. Um, and then we have descriptive norms, which were significant in solar models. And like we said, there's a lot of literature on how pure effects impact solar. So um, it's not surprising that this would be a very significant factor when it comes to people's you know, comfort level and perceptions um, towards um, towards solar. And then uh, finally, the customer awareness of the cost of solar really hasn't caught up with the costs. You know, remember we said in the last five years we've had nearly an 80% decline in the cost of solar. 
and people really haven't updated their, their understanding of solar or whether or not they can afford it. With the addition of leases to solar, then we also see this much more affordable mechanism for acquiring solar, and people really aren't aware of leases. Um, so, so, the, so opinion really isn't keeping up with how things are changing on the ground. Um, so once we finished this initial survey and this analysis, we, um, we took our control group, um, you know, asked them to do the final survey. We got about a 50% respo response rate. Um, then we asked a larger portion of people to play the game. Email invites are very difficult, but we were emailing people, and, you know, asking them to sign up, and about 50% of those who did completed the final survey. Uh, so this was, you know, a, a, a good comparison, um, you know, to be able to look at um, to look at these two groups, and we also found there was no significant difference um, on our socio-demographic um, measures. So, um, so that was also uh, made things a lot simpler in looking at the results. Um, so some of the highlights of the game, we had an 85% participation rate. Uh, so that's kind of the number of questions that were played over the number of questions that were available to be played across all participants. And, and this was really exciting because it means that once you have people engaged, they're really engaged. They're, they're playing the game. They're getting all of the content. Um, that also makes things easier for us because we didn't have to guess if the effects we were seeing were related to only seeing half the content or all of the content or which part of the content. Everybody pretty much saw all of the content. Um, the other significant part here was that 11 minutes per week per player on average. So the results that we do see from this game, we're seeing with less than half an hour of effort on the part of the people playing. And that's really big when you're looking at information search costs. Most people, when they're, they're thinking about these things, are spending a lot more time. Um, and I can attest to having built the curriculum, it takes a lot more than a half hour to find all this information and find the information that's applicable to us here in Texas. Um, I read one really great article on how weatherizing could save you energy and I was like, oh, this is a great methodology and this is good and okay, this will explain everything. And then I got to the, about three quarters of the way down and it said Toronto, Canada. I thought, oh boy, I don't think any of this was useful. And imagine how frustrating that would be if you're trying to learn about a new technology and you don't have an engineering background to rely on. Um, not, not so easy. Um, then we looked at, you know, kind of right answers and wrong answers. What of the information did people already know? And not surprisingly, uh, Texans know about their air conditioners. Uh, so that wasn't too surprising. On solar, it was kind of the softball questions that people were getting right. And that told us that really there isn't a lot of literacy around solar energy um, in these areas. Um, on wrong answers, um, vampire power, dishwasher efficiency. Uh, for those of you who don't know, if your dishwasher is less than 10 years old, it's more efficient to use the machine than to wash by hand. And it's always great when you can give people a tip that allows you to be lazy and feel good about it. Um, and then with uh, solar, we had the cost of solar. You know, like I said, people really aren't understanding the investment potential of solar, the immediate payback, that, you know, that, that starts coming with solar. Um, you're fixing your energy costs in a volatile, you know, with volatile energy prices. Um, and then panel lifetime and performance. And, and, and like I mentioned before, it's, this is a totally new system for people. It's not replacing any thing that we have direct experience with. So understanding how solar panels work and how they're going to perform and feeling confident and comfortable with that information um, is a significant challenge. Uh, we got feedback from people, and this is the anecdotal. You know, 70%, nearly 70% intend to implement something from the games. So the information was good for them. It really resonated with them. Um, we also asked if the solar energy information was more likely to make them consider installing solar at some point in the future. And here we got a 5.5 out of 7. Um, so that was really encouraging. You know, people are definitely feeling more comfortable if they're giving answers like that. And then on open comments, just have a couple quotes from people here on, on how they were responding to the game. So you, from this perspective, it was very successful, but as scientists, we always want to drill down and uh, go through the data. And so we did a repeated measures ANOVA on the data, looking at you know, the pre-survey and then looking at the post-survey. And um, in this case, um, we found that PBC and intentions were con consistently affected, um, both in energy conservation and in solar energy. Um, and that's if you're comparing, so kind of looking at the post-survey score minus the pre-survey score and then comparing that between the two cohorts. Um, um, so this shows that, you know, it, 
that really as we're bridging the information gap, as we're providing this information, people do feel agency. They do now feel like they have more control over being able to engage with solar and benefit from solar. And then we also see that the um, interactive nature of the trivia game um, you know, test that knowledge. You know, as we saw, that we can look at the, the wrong and right answers and we can really see where the gaps are and, and, and see that there are some repeat questions. So we can kind of see these aha moments happening that people are going, oh, okay, now I, I get it more. And, and that's reflected in the higher perceived behavioral control um, that people have after the game. Um, and then awareness of incentives. We had a tenfold increase in awareness of incentives in the um, group that played the game compared to the control group that did not play the game. And, and what was kind of interesting here is even in those who played the, uh, who did not play the game, the control group, we said, how did you hear about these incentives? And one of the people said, from this survey. So they put together that if I was asking about incentives, it meant that there were some. And then they went to seek them out. And so what that kind of tells me is that if you're looking at this game, you know, most people who are doing the game are not going to have before and after surveys. That's part of using the game for research. If you're actually using this for outreach from a utility, you're not even going to see that increase in knowledge that's coming from taking the survey. Um, so you might see even more benefit and more increased awareness relative you know, to, to a, you know, a control group that has absolutely no interaction. Um, so that was really exciting. I think, I think tenfold um, awareness increase is big. And, and that also tells us that incentives are not really reaching passive audiences. You know, if you're very motivated to get a solar system, you're going to go out there and you're going to look. And you're going to say, you know, what sort of incentives? Also, if you've ever engaged in any sort of energy efficiency, you know, like when I installed um, new uh, honeycomb blinds, the manufacturer is telling you, go get this tax rebate. I never would have thought that there would be a tax rebate for my blinds. But there was. And now I know, well, hey, if I'm doing this, I should look. Maybe there's, maybe there's something for this, you know, the solar thing too, or maybe there's something for this other upgrade I want to do. So, so, but if I hadn't engaged in that, I never would have even thought to look. And so we have to wonder, are there a lot of people out there, you know, these people were very receptive to solar. They had very positive attitudes towards solar. Um, the people paying the game, it was over a six out of seven in terms of their attitude, how positive their attitude was. But if they're not aware of these types of tax incentives to even go out and look for them, then you have to wonder if this information was, was more available, would even more people be taking up this offer? Um, so I think that, you know, that, that, that definitely points to the information gap and the importance of being able to um, bridge that information gap. And then finally, we looked at the likelihood of calling to request a quote. Remember, we said in two weeks, you're not going to be able to install solar. So what can we measure as, you know, an increase in intention and, and how that might impact behavior down the road? And this is one of those key factors. If you're not you know, before you can install solar, you have to call the installer. And we also find with solar adopters that a lot of their information is coming from the installers. So just getting in contact with an installer is, is a really good next step to, to getting the information um, and, and how you're thinking about your solar installation. Um, so kind of our overall conclu conclusions with this study, um, you know, looking at the survey data, we found there's huge information gaps with solar. Um, definitely perceived as expensive, you know, definitely incomplete information on the investment potential, the incentives available, the financing mechanisms available. Um, and we definitely saw that in games that it was a significant, it wasn't just statistically significant improvement in perceived behavioral control. It was actually a full point improvement. So we went from about a three out of seven to a four out of seven, which means we went from people having a negative perception of their, of their perceived behavioral control um, for solar to being in that neutral zone, which likely indicates that they're going to be much more receptive to information on solar in the future. Uh, so we consider this to be a very, very successful first experiment in looking at gamification. And uh, we're going to do it again. So um, actually starting Monday, we'll have Energy Games DFW. And many of you might not be aware, we have a National Solar Day on October 3rd. And there are coordinated solar tours all over the country. And um, this group, North Texas Renewable Energy Group up in Dallas, had asked to do energy games as kind of a pre-tour pre event. Um, we like Dallas in that it's a much larger area. It's a little bit more mature market. So it's going to be really interesting to see if these results, um, you know, how they differ and, and what the repeatability is um, in that different market. And that concludes my talk. And I just want to acknowledge the people that we worked with. Um, funding from DOE, and we worked with AEP North and Central here in Texas. 
and the uh, Ring Ring team that designed the platform for the game, and then uh, Jay Zarniku and, and Frontier Associates, who helped a lot with outreach and uh, project design. And then I got a few, few references if you want to look for more information. Um, not exclusively homeowners. We did look for, what was that? Oh. That one. <laughs> did you isolate homeowners for the survey? Um, we isolated people living in single family homes. Um, because we were working with a transmission distribution utility, we didn't really have a way to find out homeowner or not. Um, so what we ended up doing was just stripping out addresses that had a, a, a unit number and targeting single family homes. And um, I'm trying to remember the exact number. It was over 50% that were, were homeowners. Um, but we figured living in a single family home gives you a, a pretty good understanding of energy use in a single family home and a lot of the properties that you would you know, need to think about in installing solar. Students first, okay. So you provided a lot of great information with this game. You know, I mean, it just proved good results. Um, so my question is, what are the next steps with the information that's gathered from, from the games? Uh, are there any, um, any thoughts on the future? Yeah. Um, so one of the big issues here, we have a lot of, you know, a hypothesis that the interactive nature of the game is, is really a key part here. And we'd like to compare that to more passive forms of information. Um, so we're actually getting ready to do a study looking at just kind of emailing people um, or providing people a link to a website where they can look at the information passively. And then we're, we'll be running the same survey before and after. Um, we're also extending the amount of perceived behavioral control aspects that we're looking at um, to get a better idea of people's ideas of some of the technical aspects. Because um, uh, you know, cost is definitely, at this point, the biggest issue. Um, but as the costs are coming down, some of the other aspects of solar are, I think, we're going to start to, to dominate. So we kind of want to get ahead of that and, and start looking at a, a more holistic picture of people's uh, perceived behavioral control and the factors there. So. Thank you very much for your uh, speech there, your presentation. Um, my question is, so you have all this information, the information you've shared with all these single home uh, owners now. Are you going to follow up with the utility and actually see if they actually implement any of that knowledge that they have and, and follow utility bills and see if they're actually cutting on their savings, reducing their Following energy? utility bills is, is a particular challenge. You know, definitely something you'd love to do when you're looking at energy usage. Um, but because of privacy issues, that, that's kind of something we won't be able to do. Uh, we did send a brief follow-up to people asking them um, if they've changed their energy use behavior, if they've implemented energy upgrades, and if they've installed solar. And we found on upgrades they were 50-50 with control group and the, um, and the game group. Um, on behavioral usage, the game group actually was quite a bit more of them saying that they were implementing and, and changing the way they used energy. We can't really confirm that without any energy data. It could just be that they're more aware of the behaviors they're engaging in. And then with solar, we actually saw one person from each group install solar. Um, Unfortunately, by the time you get to the third survey and you only have 50% response, uh, response rate, we're kind of comparing like 12 people, <laughs> um, you know, 12 people to 30 people and, and, and it gets a little bit difficult to, um, I think, draw meaningful conclusions. Um, but it, you know, it does look like even participating in a study is kind of raising some of the awareness of solar. Um, but, you know, even in, a, in any group of 12, the odds of somebody installing solar are pretty small, so we need to definitely scale up the survey to do that kind of follow-on study. That's definitely something we'd like to do. Thanks, very interesting work and a great presentation. Thank you. Um, so when I think of games, I just wonder, um, have you found any, and maybe this is the next step of research, are there any different forms of games or types of games that 
are more effective for different demographic groups, either age, sex, culture, cultural background. You know, I think of games in terms of either fast cars, zombies, angry <laughs> or happy birds, or things like that. Sure. Have you explored any of that? And a totally different topic is on the cost side, dealing with taxes with the complexity of our tax code is really pretty strange and complex. And the tax credit is actually a, a non-refundable. And so I think 40 or 50 percent of earners in this country don't pay any federal income tax. So if you don't have any income tax to offset, you don't get that credit. You may be able to do a tax credit carry forward, but I wonder how that may play into the cost analysis or fear or belief that it's more expensive. Hmm. So two, okay. two different questions. So on the first question, um, yeah, I mean, we kind of looked at the different genres of games, and there are tons of genres of games. And getting into which type of game communicates which type of information to which demographic, um, that's, that's kind of its whole other research <laughs> um, all on its own. So in this case, um, we just tried to identify a platform. We're not game designers, so we're just trying to identify a platform that we think will be effective for the type of information we're trying to deliver. And, you know, if, if you don't see any change or you don't see any results, then you can only say that that one game didn't cause a result. Let's look at more games. Um, in this case, it was great that we did see a significant Im impact from this type of game. And so we know that that this type of game is, you know, is effective. The simulation type games are used a lot in education, and I think they have a lot of potential for teaching system level types of information, uh, but they require a lot more time to learn how to play the game and to engage in the game to really uh, get that benefit out of it. So you know, I'm not so sure that, that those types of games are gonna be good for you know, reaching out to kind of the busy people um, and, and really looking at that information search cost, you know, particularly with time, regard to time. Um, on the tax credit issue, uh, it's hard to know. I mean, at this point, I would say with this demographic, if only 15% are even aware of incentives, that's definitely not influencing their pictures of cost at this point because it's, it's not a factor for them if they're not aware of it. Um, I believe the distribution of income, um, you know, people were in the 50 to 75 was the, was the, the mode for that. Um, so in that group, I think people will be paying taxes and will be able to take some advantage of that tax credit. But, um, I mean, that's definitely an issue. You know, and there's certainly some people who are, who are banking on getting that 30%, and then when they go to fill out their taxes, realize that they're not going to get the full, you know, 30%. Um, uh, so that, yeah, that is a difficulty. But, you know, you do have, in this case, we're in a territory with a $1.20 a watt rebate, so, or incentive. They're very clear. Don't call it a rebate. Call it an incentive. Um, so, you know, and, and that's still significant, and that's you know, not on an income basis. So that's available to everybody. Um, and it's already gone down to $1.10 per watt, so, so it, is, it is declining. Thank you. Um, I'm curious about the limitations of gamification. Uh, do you think that it allows reaching out to passive customers in sort of any way? Uh, or that the people that you that did reach out and were willing to play sort of wanted to be activated to begin with and you sort of offered them facilitated a way to get that done yeah that's a you know a difficult thing to answer at, at this point and, and I would say that um, you know if you have people who have some motivation and you're giving them the option between 30 minutes to play a game and you know three four five ten hours researching online to get the same information um, that you're still activating a group of people who probably wouldn't be activated, especially this early stage where we're still trying to get into, you know, the, the early adopter group. So you have people who, um, we're actually still kind of targeting people who have more motivation than average um, and, and trying to activate them. So I think it's very appropriate for this phase of, of where we are in the diffusion of solar, uh, but it is difficult to know, you know, how is this going to work at scale for a utility, um, who is actually going to be engaged. This was largely done on smartphones, so if people don't have smartphones, how are we engaging them? Um, you know, there are a lot of those, those aspects, um, and I think those come down the road. You know, the, the, the first thing is, is it effective? Will it, you know, will it work? Let's not spend tons of money from a utility doing this if, if it turns out that it doesn't actually do anything. So 
Um, uh, thank you for the wonderful talk. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm just curious, uh, how important would um, dropping of costs of solar energy uh, be in comparison to its relative cost to other uh, sources of energy? I mean, uh, it could influence decision making, I mean, it could influence your behavior in some sense, but the ultimate decision making, the driving force behind it would always be the comparative cost at that point of time, right? I mean, so uh, so what, what do you think about that? I mean, so how, how exactly would it uh, sort of put things in action? I mean, how would this uh, initiate action in, in people? to change the You attitude. mean if the price continues to drop or? So, so I understand that prices continue to drop, but mm -hmm. I guess it would still be costlier than others, right? I mean, at that particular point of time, if I, if I go ahead and, um, you know, make a purchase. So wouldn't the, that, that relative cost be the driving force instead of a drop of price in solar? I mean, people wouldn't care more about a dropping uh, price in solar energy, but but the relative cost. Uh, yeah. Sure, it's always it, you know can can I afford it is a question, and I think our point with the the dropping you know that eighty percent drop over the last five years is really to say that people you don't know when people are seeing information. So if you started looking into solar, you got interested in solar, and you looked at it five years ago, and you have a price in your head, and you've decided whether or not you can afford it based on that price. So when you see this rapid decline. Um, it's, it's not that the, the, the issue of the rapid decline is that people aren't reassessing solar frequently enough to get current information and to have good information. So they're making a decision on, on a five-year-old price instead of today's price. And, and that's really where we're trying to get to. It always depends on is it affordable to you. And even with an 80% cost drop, it may still not be affordable for somebody. But if they're making that decision based on five-year-old information, it's way off at this point. Um, and so we need people to reevaluate what that cost is and, and reevaluate whether or not it's affordable for them. Is, does that answer? Okay. Um, hi. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, just curious, it was the purpose somewhat twofold in the sense of it was information gathering, but at the same time educating the participants that were quote unquote playing? And you also talked about how they took surveys at, at several different stages, and of course they played the game. Of course, I wonder if there's also a gray area. If it's a trivia game to me, it also sounds kind of similar to a survey. So if you told people, hey, would you like to take this survey, maybe they're like, great. You know, like you get surveys even if you go to the bank for five minutes. It's a 15-minute survey, and you only run the bank for five minutes. Um, but sounding, saying, hey, would you like to play a game? Maybe there's a psychology aspect there to where people are more willing to do that versus taking a survey. I, I think so. I mean, you know, definitely, um, you know, there's incentives in the games. There's competition. There's, you know, there's leaderboard. So there are definitely these, these aspects of it that, that do make it a little bit more fun. I mean, there's, you know, there's definitely a question of how drawn will people be to a trivia game. Um, though people play trivia games quite a bit. So yeah. apparently that, it, you know, People who hate exams will take trivia games, and it's not even clear what the difference is between, you know, those two things. So, um, yeah, there's there's definitely a psychology to just putting it, at, you know, in that wrapper of a game, and and making it competitive and making it social, um, that makes it different. You know, that makes it different. I think. Uh, hi, the talk was really, the presentation was really good. So my question is, uh, some people do not hold off on buying solar because the cost is dropping and they want to see if it drops even more. Mm -hmm. So was that a factor in this group or it, at all or was it assessed in the survey at all? Uh, we didn't really assess that. Um, I kind of assume that people will make that assessment on technology because so much of our experience with technology is how much cheaper it will get. And, and we actually do address that in the game where one of the questions is about what do you ex expect the cost of solar to do over the next three years? And the answer is that it's going to stay pretty level. And you know, if you just look at that curve, we're hitting that plateau. Um, and then we go further in the insight to then say, the prices are staying flat, but the rebates are starting, or the incentives are starting to decline. So now is a great time to invest in solar. Um, so that's the way that we try to combat that thought process is really, you know, a lot of people aren't used to assessing things in that much detail, um, especially if you don't naturally have a quantitative thought process. Um, and so we really wanted to connect those dots for people by including these different parts of the information to kind of lead them through 
you know, how to make that decision and how to evaluate that cost. Um, but we don't, we don't know how many people were kind of thinking that ahead of time. It's, you know, it's kind of an assumption that that's, that's how people approach technology these days.